Menashe upon a regime. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Alhamdulillah, in the Dila Yablo, mid the Hatu Hul Kailun. Wala Yursi Nama Ahula Adun, Wala Yuadi Hako Hul Mustahidun. Aladila Yudriko Hobo Odul Himam, Wala Yanalo Hul Salfitan. ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في العرضين صاحب العصى والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداءهم أجمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ضرب الله مثلا للذين آمنوا أمرعة فرعون إذ قالت ربي ابني لي عندك بيت في الجنة ونجني من فرعون وعمله ونجني من القوم الظالمين صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليه وسلم The essentials of a successful Islamic family has been our topic Tonight is lecture number three and as I mentioned to you for the very first day, we have a, uh, an agenda a schedule of these lectures. And yesterday we started off our discussion talking about the role of the husband inside the household. And we mentioned how the husband is the wali of the household, the sarparast, he is the leader of the household. However, his kamal, his perfection, his ata'at of Allah is to lead with mercy and compassion and love, not with dhulm and oppression and tyranny inside the home. And as I promised to you, I would discuss today the role of the wife inside the house. The wife plays a very important role inside the home. Islam says that she is the glue of the house. She is what keeps everything flowing inside the house. She is the one that keeps everybody happy in the house. Where you have, let's say, a problem between the father and one of the children, she comes in and she patches things up. Or where you have a problem, let's say, where the child is sick and not doing too well and the father and the husband has no idea what to do, she'll come in and she'll know exactly what to do. Ask yourself, those of you who sometimes your, your wife goes away for a couple of weeks or a month, she goes to India or Pakistan, she comes back, and within two or three weeks you are by yourself with your children. Usually I've heard of cases where husbands actually call their wife back after a couple of weeks and say, look, I can't handle this. <laughs> you know, the kids are having pizza for breakfast or having cookies for dinner. They're sleeping in the clothes, we haven't done laundry in three weeks, the dishes aren't done, the bills haven't been paid yet, I have no idea how you do everything. We used to call them housewives, now they're called domestic engineers in this day and age. Because they literally run that household like an engineer would run at a, at a workplace. It's flawless. And sometimes we don't appreciate it as husbands. But the role of the wife is just that. She keeps the machine rolling inside the house. She has a system in place. And so the very first thing we talked about yesterday, if you remember, was embracing the path of your fitrah. And the fitrah of the woman is that she's able to do multiple things at one time. Us as males, us as husbands, we can't do it. If one child is crying, we focus our entire energy on that one child. The other one needs the bathroom or is hungry or is thirsty. He has to wait until I've done this child and then I'll go over there. Our mothers, our wives have this incredible uh, fitri power inside of them to do four or five things at once. 
This should be appreciated inside the homes. However, the role of the wife doesn't stay there. When it comes to the relationship with the husband, Imam Ali alayhi salatu was salam, he says that the jihad of a woman, the jihad, she is a mujahida fi sabilillah when? When she is trying to make her husband happy. That is her jihad. And her success in the hereafter is completely and absolutely related to the happiness and the contentment of her husband inside her house. Not as a slave or a master, but as somebody who is the assistant or beside the leader of the home. I mentioned yesterday, I say it again, the husband is the wali of the house. But beside him is his wife. Beside him is the woman of the house who's equally important in this role, of course, as well. So it is a struggle, because sometimes we are difficult men to, to, to live with. Sometimes we become children ourselves. I have two daughters, but when, my, when someone asks me how much kids my wife has, she says, I have three kids. My two daughters and my husband as well. You know, she picks up the clothes after my daughter, and she picks up my socks as well in the corner. We're sometimes very difficult to live with. That's why the jihad is there. But what are the secrets of keeping us happy? The secrets of running this household? Let's examine this. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Remember, if we were to do a khulasa bandi of what a husband wants from the wife, it boils down to respect. We want to be able to feel like the wife looks at us as her husband and knows that no matter what difficulty as a family we go through, no matter what hardship we go through, my husband will handle it. He'll solve the problem. He'll free us, he'll give us nijat from this struggle. And in the process, what we do is we have complete etimad and trust in the husband. And that's what we want. The moment that we find that the wife has disrespected us or has lost respect for us, because when you lose respect, what ends up happening is you challenge the husband every step of the way. Then that creates a very chaotic, a very disturbing environment inside the home. You know, the, the, the power of the woman is such, and again, this is a hadith by Imam Rada alayhi salatu was salam as well. He says the power of the woman is that she can create an environment of heaven inside of her home or she can create an environment of the hellfire inside her home as well. When you look at homes that mashallah are run on love and respect, the kids and the parents are well in tune spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, they're all on the same page. All the credit goes to the woman and the mother inside the house. We are not home most of the time. At least we shouldn't be home most of the time. We should be out doing what we're supposed to do, that's earning. Yes. She is the one who is at home making sure that all the holes are filled up and the kids are in their routine, etc., etc. However, you come to a household where there's chaos, no tarbiyah, no nurture, nothing. They are not a family. There are roommates living in the same house. Don't talk to each other. No love, no respect, no compassion. Then again, the hadith says that we have to examine the woman inside that house. To see, is she able to convert this house into paradise or not? That's the power of the woman. How can she do that? She starts off with the husband. The first thing that the wife has to understand is that we as the husbands turn to you for the sense of calmness in our life. It's stressful enough outside the house when we have to earn and provide and the stress of the economy and the stress of, uh, of this lifestyle in the West home prices are now going up, etc., etc. If we were to come home and immediately that stress from the wife is on top of us, that becomes a problem for us. So the role of the, of, of the wife is literally to be a sense of comfort for the husband, to erase that pressure from the outside. Tomorrow, of course, is a wafat 
اب بی بی خدیجہ سلام اللہ علیہ صلی اللہ علیہ محمد وآلہ محمد حضر And we'll talk about her sacrifice tomorrow, but at least one sacrifice that's well noted inside history is that while the pressures of Risalat of Rasulullah were outside the home, she created a mahalaya sukoon inside the house for the Holy Prophet. Her sacrifice, of course, is there. But the biggest sacrifice was when the Prophet would come after him having feces thrown on him, garbage thrown on him, name calling, threaten his life, everything. That's stressful for anybody, including the Holy Prophet, to come home and immediately she would lie him down and she would relax him, she would massage his head, etc, etc. These are the things that the role of the wife inside the home is like. It's to not add to the stress on our shoulders, but perhaps lighten the load of the stress on our shoulders. That's point number one. Point number two is that when it comes time for difficulty, you see the Quran says, لَقَدْ insana, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا insana fi kabad." We have created the insan in the cradle of distress, of hardship, of struggle. Nobody in this room is free of struggle. No family in this room is free of struggle. Every family goes through its difficulties. Every family goes through its hardship. If it's not financial, it's the stress of the children. If it's not the stress of the children, it's the stress of the fact that my child is married, but he hasn't had kids in three, four years. That's another stress, and so on and so on and so forth. What the wife should do is stand beside the husband and fighting this struggle and this problem day in and day out. If God forbid, if God forbid, the husband loses his job and is out there now trying to fight and find his job, the last thing that he wants to hear from his wife of all people, who should be his best friend, his companion, his associate, his life partner, is this fact that, oh great, you lost your job. Now my dream of stainless steel appliances and big screen TVs and a, and a bigger home is gone. What he doesn't want to hear is that when you go to a daba at someone's house, you take mental images of the things inside their house. Click here, click here, click here, then you download at home and say, did you see their appliances? Did you see their hardwood floors, their crown molding, the cars in the driveway, the size of their house? When are we going to get that? And that adds more stress to the husband. Instead, what you can say is, look, you've lost your job, it's okay. Wallahu khayru raziqi. Allah is the raziq. I'll stand beside you. If it means that we sacrifice less our spending, I won't go here, I won't buy here, maybe I'll sell my gold, maybe I'll work with you. These are things what a companion should do. A friend should do, a life partner should do, is immediately feel like, look, everything will be okay. I have my wife right beside me. That's all I need. But if she's poking and priding and constantly hooing and hawing and huffing and puffing and sighing and dying, then that adds stress to the husband. And the jihad of the woman is not to add stress to the woman, to, to the husband, it's to remove that stress. You know, the Quran has a very beautiful examples of two sets of wives when it comes to the Prophet. And other Prophets as well. Sallu ala Muhammad wa alayhi Surah Tahrim, the 66th chapter of this glorious Quran, ayats number 10 and 11. They tell stories of two different sets of wives and where they'll end up in the Akhirat. The first one, they say, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ كَفَّرُوا أَمْرَأَةُ نُوحٍ وَلُوت They first give the example of the wives of Nuh and Lut. The ayat says that we place them under the care and the supervision of our righteous servants. Their husbands were prophets of God, men of piety, God-fearing men. There's no doubt in our mind that they were the best of husbands. And yet nowhere do we find that they supported their husbands. In fact, they were a thorn in their side every step of the way. And the Quran in the end says their akhirat, their akibat is what? The nar, the hellfire. Nothing else. 
And then right after that, in the 11th verse of this surah, it brings about another example of another wife. It's the ayat that went free in the khutbah. Where the verse says again, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثْلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَمْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِبْنِ لِي بَيْتْ إِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجْنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجْنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ The example they give is that of the wife of Fir'aun, Bibi Asiya. You know, the, just in brackets, <coughs> The topic of du'a is one of the most beautiful topics we have in Islam. And we have a special connection to du'a, why? Because we've been left a treasure by the Ahl al-Bayt of du'as. How to supplicate, what to say when, in what context, in what lahja, etc, etc. There's a story in the life of our Holy Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> When he was announced as the Prophet, or when he announced himself as the Prophet of Allah, and this momentum of Islam began to gain a little bit of speed, there was a man who before Risalat used to assist the Holy Prophet in things that he needed. Sometimes he'd even allow him to stay at his house, etc., etc. The friend of that individual went to him one day and said, do you remember that individual called Muhammad the Amin, who you used to assist many, many years ago? He said, yes, I remember him. He said, do you know that he has now announced himself as the prophet of God? And he's gaining momentum? And now he's on his way to establishing a government and conquering the peninsula right now? He said, if I were you, I would go back to this Muhammad and remind him of who you are and what you did for him and ask for something in return. He does just that. He goes to the Holy Prophet and says, do you remember who I am? The Prophet says, of course I remember who you are. He said, well, you now have control of Medina, you have the government, there is all these riches and everything at your disposal. I'd like a little bit of payback for what everything I did for you before this whole prophethood started. The prophet says, no problem, what would you like? X amount of camels, X amount of this, X amount of that. All duniyai things. The prophet grants him his wish and then he says something very important. He says, if only he asked from me what the old woman asked from Nabi Musa. What did the old woman ask from Nabi Musa? The story is very beautiful. And we'll get to the ayat about Bibi Yas in a moment. When Nabi Musa finally freed the Bani Israel from the clutches of Fir'aun, and they were making their way out of Egypt towards Palestine, half a million individuals were with Musa in the middle of the night. And as he was exiting Egypt, the hadith says, or story says, he lost his way. And he gathered the elders of the Bani Israel tribe and said, look, what do we do here? And one individual reminded Nabi Musa that there was one thing that we didn't do on our way out of Egypt. And this is the cause of us being lost right now. He said, when Nabi Yusuf left this world, he said, take my body. When Nabi Musa leaves Egypt, make sure you tell him to take my coffin with him outside of Egypt. We forgot to take Nabi Yusuf with us. Nabi Musa asks, does anybody here know where Nabi Yusuf is buried? Nobody steps forward. He announces to the entire Bani Israel tribe, is there anybody here who can tell me where Nabi Yusuf is buried? A very frail, a very old woman comes and steps forward and says, I know where that, that, that prophet is buried. But I won't give it to you just like that. I want something in return. He says, what, what do you want? She says, I have pain in both of my legs. I can barely walk. I want power to be restored back in my legs, number one. Mm. Number two, on the day of judgment, I want to be risen beside you, Nabi Musa. Hey, hey. Imam 
امام جعفر الصادق عليه الصلاة والسلام In this hadith, in Mizaw Hikmah, narrates this story. He says that this was granted to the old woman by Nabi Musa. And she revealed to him the location of the grave. And they moved away out of Egypt. Why do I bring this up? Because look at the level at which the du'as were asked in by the people to the Prophet. This man's asking for a few camels, maybe a few acres of land, etc., etc. This one's asking for what? For us to be risen with Nabi Musa. Mm. What is Bibi Asiya asking for in this ayat? What is she asking for? And does she have any right to ask for such a beautiful dua? Again, let's examine this verse. If Allah Rabbi ibn li baytan indaka fil jannah. Oh Allah, build for me, build for me a house in Jannat where I am beside you, Allah, in Jannat. It's one thing where you ask for Jannat. It's one thing where you ask for a house in Jannat. It's a whole different level when you ask for a house where Allah is now your neighbor inside Jannat. Beside you. Why was she able to have the gall and the himmat and the audacity to ask for such a high level dua because she had patience and sabr with a husband like Fir'aun. Whereas the ayat before talks about the fact that Allah sent the wives of Nabi Nu and Nabi Lut, righteous servants, but they weren't patient at all. They were treacherous with their husbands. Their aqibat is not the aqibat and the akhirat of the wife of Fir'aun is what? A bait, a house in Jannah beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As bad as we are as husbands, we're not Fir'aun, are we? I don't know, alhamdulillah, we're not. So this verse is not talking about the fact, and please, I don't want to get phone calls tomorrow, inshallah. This is not about this idea that if your husband is actually Fir'aun in the house and does that much dhulm on you, that you remain quiet and take the dhulm because you'll have a bait in Jannah in the hereafter. This idea is that when things are not ideal at home, certain husbands have anger issues, certain husbands have communication issues, certain husbands don't express their love, don't buy their wives flowers or gifts, etc., etc., especially as they get older. Whereas we have a hadith, a holy prophet says that when you tell your wife that you love her, it stays in her heart forever. It doesn't mean you tell her once in Chorti. No, that, 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 that's not what it means. It means constant expression of love. Every Friday we have in our mustahabat that every Friday we should have a little bit of a token to our wife. Instead of buying 12 roses or 24 roses, one rose every week, every Friday. Things will begin to change. Not just for young guys like me, my elders especially. If you walk in one day and you give your wife a flower, she'll say, well, did you steal this from the neighbor? What happened? Where is this coming from and what do you want? Where do you want to go? You want permission? For something? Why is this flower in front of me? But that's the idea that we need to be patient inside of our homes. Yes, we have difficulties, we have deficiencies as, as husbands. Our, our women, our wives are emotionally charged individuals. We are not, we're logically charged. And love is not logic, love is all emotion. And sometimes when she's waiting for you to, let's say, comment on what she's wearing, or tell you, you know, let's go shopping, it's your sister's wedding next weekend, you don't have any new kapre, let's go get a, a suit for you. She's waiting for all these things, and she doesn't get it, she'll complain. Be patient inside the home. I'm not saying for you to do dhulm, if there's abuse happening in your house, that's a problem. But I'm saying if things are not ideal inside of your house, look at the Quranic example of Bibi Asiya. She lived in a kingdom of the biggest mushrik of the time. And we know by this verse that she wasn't a mushrik. She was a believer. Otherwise she wouldn't call, Ya Rabbi ibn li baytain daka jannat. 
She calls Allah Rabbi, my Rabb, my Lord. She accepts Allah to be her Lord, even though her husband might be the one who says, Ana Rabbil Alameen. So what do we need? We need patience, forbearance, the hamul, sabr inside of our homes. Yes, things are not ideal sometimes. But sometimes what is important is for us to understand that the attempt and the effort of our husbands is there. Recognize that. Don't make him feel like what you, what you have isn't enough. Be thankful for what you have and let him know that I don't need these things. I'm happy so long as his household is functioning under the wilayat of the Ahlul Bayt. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And a point to the husbands here, if you have a wife who's not demanding of these things, you know, you, you should know some wives out there are very demanding. They require something new constantly. It's outside of the financial scope of the husband. It doesn't matter. We'll put it on credit card. We'll put it. We'll charge this and charge that. It doesn't matter. I have to compete with those around me. I don't want to go to a jashan or to a wedding and wear a suit that's three years old. God forbid. I'll stand out. So I'm going to put pressure on you to get me the latest and greatest suit, for example, or the set, for example, or makeup, for example, etc. Why? So I can compete. We live in a society of Joneses. If my friend has a house this big, I want a house this big. If you don't have a wife like that, fall into sajda and say, shukr alhamdulillah. I'm dead serious. If your wife is okay with the fact that she hasn't gone shopping in years or bought anything for years, it doesn't mean that you say, oh, thank you very much. No, it should actually encourage you and motivate you to surprise her once in a while. And say, I know you don't ask me for anything, but before you even ask, here you go. Her heart will melt. When her heart melts, look, happy wife, happy life. It's a very simple equation. It's so true. There's nothing worse than a woman at home who's not happy, who's miserable, who's stressed out, and you are the cause of that stress. And it doesn't take a lot to make our wives happy. It's one thing I've learned the hard way. You don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. One thing from the dollar store, pick it up and say, look, this is for you, just for you, for nobody else. It could be a dollar, 99 cents, whatever the case may be. Don't do that, but it could be like that. <laughs> then she'll melt. And then you're off for at least a couple of weeks. And then you can enjoy the benefits. Don't take for granted if you have a woman who's sacrificial at home, who puts up with the fact that your mother treats her ill, speaks ill of her in public and she doesn't say a single word goes around and bashes her baho to every single two sets of ears that listens and when she and people ask her about her saas but yet she saas hamari says nothing to anybody that's worthy of praise identify that recognize that otherwise if you don't give her that avenue like i said yesterday she won't talk to you about her problems she'll talk to her bffs her best friends and that's when the hormat of your home is gone out of your hands. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this qaleel ibad inshallah. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our homes, our domestic issues are increasing unfortunately. Our divorce rates are up. Our children are losing control. We ask you Allah, we beg you Allah in this month of Allah, it's a month of family, it's a month of society. Bless our homes with the love and the compassion of the Ahlul Bayt. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the sins of our marhumin and of our parents insha'Allah. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much tyranny, so much injustice in Iraq, in Syria, Pakistan, all over the world. Hasten the reappearance of the wali of Allah and make us his ansar when he comes insha'Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For, oh sure. We have a group, Amma Yujib, inshallah, five times for the individuals in Iraq and those really who are sick and ill in need of our du'as, inshallah. Five times, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amma Yujib al-Mustarra ila da'a wa yakshif al-Sum. Amma Yujib al-Mustarra ila da'a wa yakshif al-Sum. 
عما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء عما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء عما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء اللهم صل على محمد